In the early days of video games, they were exactly that. Games on a video screen. As the years have gone by, many game designers have found opportunities to make artistic experiences. Certain people have even been lauded as auteurs, carefully crafting every aspect of each game to fit their conceptual vision. Names like Hideo Kojima, Yu Suzuki, Suda51, Shigesato Itoi, and others known for communicating their personalities and influences through their work. However, this has only become openly recognized in recent years. There are likely many creators from the beginnings of the industry who cared just as much as those names we know now. There is one man in particular whose specialty was thinking outside of the box. His name was Kenji Ino. Kenji Ino was born on May 5, 1970. From an early age, his creativity shone through, and he attended a school for gifted children. In the second grade, his mother mysteriously disappeared and was never found, an event which he never elaborated on much in interviews. He was raised by his single father for the rest of his childhood. He told Core Gamer that the first video game he ever truly played was Pac-Man. However, the first game he became obsessed with was Space Invaders. He described, It was the first big impact of a video game to me. I was addicted to it. I felt some kind of new culture appear. He went into further detail with 1UP, claiming, That was probably love at first sight. The sound was also what attracted me to it. Sound meant a lot to Kenji as a child, as this was when his deep interest in music began to develop. When talking about his musical influences later on, he would mention listening to the Beatles as a child, and later Bjork as an adult. In junior high, he discovered techno music, and became a huge fan of Yellow Magic Orchestra, whom would remain a major musical influence for the rest of his life. Kenji began performing music as part of the school band in elementary school, where he played the tuba. <laughs> He wanted a synthesizer, but they were too expensive, so at age 10 he learned how to make music using a PC his father had bought. This meant he had to learn the basics of programming as well. When he was 13, he used these skills to enter a magazine's programming competition where readers designed their own games. His game, Toadoko Murder Case, won the competition, and Kenji walked away with a few thousand dollars. He then became tired of programming, and spent the next several years obsessed with movies, music, and art. He dropped out of high school when he was 17 and spent some time traveling around Japan. One day, he overheard some neighbors talking about him, saying, He used to be a good kid. He was very smart when he was younger, but now he doesn't even go to school, as well as how they felt sorry for his father. Fearing he was shaming his family, he decided it was time to begin working. He picked up a job recruiting magazine called From A and applied for a job at a Canon copy machine company. He got the job, but halfway through his first day, he got into a fight with his boss and quit. From the same magazine, he found a sales job at a telemarketing company. While he quickly proved to be a decent salesman, selling more than other employees on his first day, he didn't like working there, and quit without working a second day. He picked up the magazine for a third time and found an opening for a programmer at a game company called Interlink. He brought the game he had designed years earlier with him to his interview, and got the position because of it. The problem with accepting a job as a programmer was that Kenji hadn't programmed anything since that competition. Things like hard disks and MS-DOS were new to him. When this became apparent, he was almost let go, but he desperately informed his boss that he could still compose and plan. So, he was given a chance in those departments. His first projects were as composer for the Famicom version of Altered Beast and a Gundam game called SD Hero Sukasen. One day, he took a peek at the game plan for Ultraman Club 2. In his words, it was crap, and he told the team, Okay, this isn't fun at all, so let's change it. Surprisingly, they took his opinion seriously, and Eno was promoted to planner for the game. Over the course of a year, the company grew from 10 people to 30. Kenji began to feel claustrophobic, and in his own words, I couldn't use 100% of my ability. So in 1989, Kenji quit his job at Interlink, and established an independent game company called EIM Limited Company for entertainment, imagination, and magnificence. They produced games such as Parallel World, Time Zone, and Miyasu Nanki no Quiz 18 Ken. This is also where Kenji's earliest well-known works originated, such as the soundtracks for Casino Kid 2 and Panic Restaurant, the latter of which he was the concept planner and supervisor for as well. Perhaps most famous is the final game EIM developed, an unfinished Superman title intended to be published by Sunsoft. Due to the licensor's frustrating demands, such as Superman can't die or be damaged, the game became difficult to conceptualize and was cancelled. It was then revived as Sunman. the exact same game, but redesigned to exclude any Superman iconography. The player travels five worlds and multiple levels on a quest to find and defeat Spectre. 
Kenji remembered the game as being unfinished. However, ROMs of both Sunman and its Superman skin beta exist on the internet, with some creators even making physical cards of them. While running his own company might sound like a great feat for Kenji, he was unhappy with his work. He explained, Since the beginning of my career, I had wanted to create original games, and so I went independent in order to do that. But after a while, even if I was making original games, I was forced to put licensed characters in the titles. For a while, he was able to encourage his team that making licensed games was cool, but he wasn't convinced himself. It began to majorly affect his mental health, to the point where he couldn't even bring himself to go to the office anymore. So in 1992, he closed EIM. He spent the next two years doing consulting work on an automotive magazine. In 1994, he traveled with the president of that magazine to San Francisco for the Macworld Expo. After spending time at the convention, they attended a counterculture event known as a BN. Kenji described it as a dark, twisted version of Macworld where the creators were all high on drugs. Here he met creators who were showcasing music and games. During the event sponsor's speech, he noticed people applauding and appreciating the company representatives. This was all a shock to Kenji, who thought for the first time, okay, game creators can be cool. It's not just nerds out there, there are actually cool creators. On the flight back to Japan, his experience at San Francisco played over and over in his mind. The freedom, the supportive environment, and the counterculture movement, combined with the news that 32-bit CD-ROM systems were on the way, sparked his creative spirit once more. During a conversation with his boss, he declared he was going to go back into game publishing, whether it was going to work out or not. The magazine president admired Kenji's ambition and invested in his new company, which was to be called... Warp was established on March 1st, 1994 with only three computers and around six employees. Kenji explains the name. First of all, Warp means twisted space. For example, in cartoons, to transfer from planet A to planet B, the fastest way is to twist space and move suddenly to your destination. There are so many channels through which game software transfers between the developer and users, such as retail stores, distributors, etc. We want to have a direct relationship with viewers by warping our games to them. Also, our thoughts are twisted. That's why we named our company Warp. The logo was designed by Kenji and designer Tomohiro Miyazaki. Kenji handled planning, producing, and much of the composing, while his team handled the brunt of the programming and art. どうもワープ代表ゆうです。今回のソフトウェアではプロコンプのグラフィックを担当しました宮崎です。え、プロコンをお願いします。以上。え、次のDの食卓でもプログラムを担当します。そちらの方もよろしくお願いします。Now all Warp needed was a publisher. All of Kenji's work so far had been on Nintendo's Famicom and NES. In his new position, however, he had to consider the cost of the units. Nintendo's price was around 1,000 yen per cartridge, which was just too high a price to pay. So he visited the newly opened Japanese branch of the 3DO company. He was treated well and told he could become a publisher whenever he wanted to. In addition, their cost per unit was significantly cheaper than Nintendo's. To top things off, 3DO is a San Francisco based company. Still inspired by his experience in the West Coast city, he wanted to work with a company that supported the indie spirit. During this budding partnership with 3DO, he met and found an admiration for 3DO and EA Games founder Trip Hawkins. Not only for his indie sensibilities, but his fun-spirited nature. According to Kenji, 
Trip kept balls in places all over the office, and he'd call out, Battle! And everybody would start throwing balls at each other. I respect Trip a lot in that way, and he influenced me a lot. He showed me how to create the atmosphere, and how to balance the creators and the management. With the partnership with 3DO finalized, it was time to create new video games. Russian Fire Megados was Warp's first release. It set the precedent for Warp and Kenji Ino's eclectic taste and quirky personality. The first examples come from the booklet itself, where each page is heading is painted on one of the Warp staff members' faces. Also included is a cutout and a guide for what not to do with the game face. One might also take note that all of Warp's 3DO releases have the Japanese name on one side of the jewel case and the English translation on the other. The game opens up at the Warp TV station, a television simulation where the player can switch between channels featuring news of Warp products, including trailers for future Warp games. There are also two playable mini games. The first is called Animalis. A basic matching game where one must match animals' pictures to save a man from getting eaten by an alligator. The second is the Oversleep of Nobunaga, a math game where the goal is to wake up Nobunaga by repeatedly slapping him. <laughs> the power of the slaps are determined by mashing the A button as many times as possible in a short time span, then choosing a random number to multiply it by. Once Nobunaga's sleep desire score is brought all the way down to zero, the player wins. <laughs> Megados is a simple, vehicle-based tournament fighter where players choose up to four characters and battle each other over various stages by pushing and shooting each other until someone either runs out of health or falls off the edge. <laughs> Items can also be used to aid the user or attack the opponent. It can be played either in a single-player tournament mode against different robots, or a two-player mode against friends. Next came Flupon the Space Mutant, a Puyo Puyo-inspired puzzle game. When four creatures are placed in the shape of a square, they form larger versions of themselves, each with different abilities. Players can choose between three different settings and three different background tracks. Outside of the main game were some interesting add-ons, starting with the manual. Lupon also includes three mini-games. The first is called Dance Heaven. It allows the player to create their own dance beats complete with visuals using the controller. The second is called Signal Flag University. Players are required to follow the directions of an unseen instructor, raising a colored flag in whatever position commanded. The third is Oyaji Hunter. It is essentially the same game as Oversleep of Nobunaga, but the goal is instead to defeat a pervert harassing a young woman. Flupon was shortly followed by a sequel, Flupon World. The Japanese version contains four games. The first is Flupon the Space Mutant 2. 
a new version of Plupon with a ridiculous enemy character selection. And some grotesque graphics. The other games are Space Plupon, an entertaining space themed adventure shooter where you face off against enemies in a quest to stop an evil space fleet. Zopon Kun, an alternate version of Plupon where players are to follow on screen instructions, and Plupon the Space Mutant 3 halves. A different kind of puzzler in which players detect combos and use them to create big Hawkins that can then be destroyed for points. Bluepon World is better known in the West as Tripped. Tripped was the first warp game to get a release in the United States. Though the Western release only included the basic game of Flupon 2, the manual was just as insane as the Japanese ones. By 1995, console-based survival horror was still in its infancy. Early founders such as Alone in the Dark and Dr. Hauser had released, but icons like Clock Tower, Resident Evil, and Silent Hill were months and years away. Nobody in 3D gaming was taking the plunge into darkness and depravity that is horror without a weapon or a cheesy presentation. That changed with D. D was released on 3DO, Sega Saturn, and PlayStation 1. Creepy, gruesome, and psychedelic, D tells the story of Laura Harris a college student who is pulled away from university when her father, Dr. Richter Harris, begins murdering everyone in the hospital he works at. She is contacted by Los Angeles police in an attempt to communicate with her father. When she arrives, she is allowed past the barricades and into the hospital. The player must then traverse a mysterious castle interior within a two hour time limit to figure out what has sent Laura's father into madness. Perhaps the most shocking aspect of D, particularly for its time, is its depiction of bloody murder and cannibalism. These gory scenes were the ones Kenji was most excited to put into his game, but he knew it wouldn't make it past the censors, so he hatched a plan to get around them. He had these scenes created in secret and didn't show anyone else in the company. He was responsible for submitting the master of the completed game to the publisher for approval, who would then review it before turning it over to the manufacturer. If he was late, he would have to pay a penalty and deliver the master himself. Knowing this, Kenji waited past the deadline, and after being sentenced the penalty, he submitted a copy without the cannibal scenes included and got it approved. Then, on the plane ride to America, he switched the clean copy with the uncensored one and submitted this to the manufacturer, who was none the wiser. To Warp's excitement, D was a success. It sold over a million copies in Japan, reaching the top of the Sega Saturn sales charts in its first week. It became an instant cult classic around the world and earned a Japan-only director's cut re-release for the 3DO that came with extended scenes, a soundtrack with four songs, a poster, a fold-out booklet, and a bonus disc with extras such as trailers, comparisons between languages and versions, and a novelization. During the production of D, Kenji got married, and he and his wife were living in a small one-room apartment. D's sales numbers changed their lives. In his own words, I was pretty broke back then. I wasn't even considering kids because I didn't have enough money to raise them. So after D's success, I was able to move to a decent, normal place, and I was able to afford kids. I finally had enough money to raise kids. That's how success changed me. Despite this success, there was one unfortunate event during the production of D that would seal the fate of Kenji Ino's future releases, and it has to do with the PlayStation port. The Sega Saturn and PlayStation ports of D were published by Acclaim Entertainment Incorporated. The sales team gathered orders for 100,000 units for the PlayStation, but Sony had given manufacturing priorities to games considered more important. Kenji was told they would only produce 40,000 copies, but they only wound up producing 28,000. This left 72,000 pre-orders from retailers unfulfilled, which infuriated Kenji. He tells the story of an interaction with a Sony representative. I was talking to a guy at Sony, and I said, okay, I'm going to go to Big Camera, and if I don't see my game there, I'm going to punch you. And they said, no, don't worry about it, it's going to be there. And I went to Big Camera, and I didn't find it, so I actually did punch this guy. That should tell you how mad I was. While that representative took a hit for Sony, this was only the beginning of Warp's wrath. Unfortunately, at the time of this recording, no pictures or videos have surfaced of the following event, though multiple witnesses have claimed it to be true, including Kenji himself. 
On March 27, 1996, Kenji was to appear at the PlayStation Expo to announce Warp's newest game, a new first-person horror experience called Enemy Zero. He made sure to get a booth as big as Sony's and gathered 200 members of the press. He presented them with the trailer, though something unexpected came at the end. A video of then-vice president of Sega saying, Welcome to Sega, followed by a video of the PlayStation logo morphing into the Sega Saturn logo. Some accounts claim that this was then followed by a video of the Warp staff singing and stomping on a plush doll of Sony's Moo Moo mascot, though Kenji denied this. He reminisced, Everybody pulled out their cell phones to report the news, and they were all confused. Like, Sony, Sega, Sony changed to Sega, and they were all confused, and that was the funniest part, that I was up there watching these guys panicking. After an explosive end to their relationship with Sony, all of Warp's major releases from then on would be Sega exclusives. While Enemy Zero was still in development, however, they released two more games exclusively for the Japanese 3DO market. The first of these is Oyaji Hunter Mahjong. At the time, there was a trend, particularly in Japan, of Mahjong and other puzzle games with the ultimate goal of revealing naked women. Kenji sought to subvert this trend, as well as to maintain a balance of producing both high and low budget games. In Oyaji Hunter Mahjong, players control superhero Oyaji Hunter, who uses Mahjong to combat perverts preying on young women. Warp's bombastic sense of humor shines through in this release, featuring slick animation headed by Ichiro Itano of Robotech fame. This art is featured extensively in the game's manual. One option in the main menu takes players to an elevator, with different floors containing different warp properties. Two of the floors allow players to play demos of Megadoss and Flupon 2. Two contain trailers of future warp games, and one is a minigame called Majorith. It is essentially a Mahjong skinned falling block puzzle game. Warp's final 3DO release is an infamous package known as Short Warp. With only 10,000 copies made, each one hand-numbered by Kenji himself, Short Warp is Warp's second most exclusive game. Players are presented with a collection of the minigames that had been included in previous games. Each game is credited individually on the back of the cover art. There's a lot to unpack here, literally. Short Warp came with multiple cover arts, advertisements, and a cardboard sleeve housing a condom. While the inclusion of a condom may seem like Kenji was simply trying to push the boundaries, there's actually a positive message behind this decision. The cover art and one of the pages of the manual both advocate for the Stop Aid movement, a progressive move for a video game developer in the mid-90s. The sleeve reminds potential users that they can either use this or lose that. As far as the games, there are nine total. Six of the games are the previously mentioned mini-games, Signal Flag University, Dance Heaven, Oyaji Hunter, Animalis, Oversleep of Nobunaga, and Majorith. Megados and Flupon 2 were actually included in their entirety as well. The only mini-game original to this disc is one called Hyper Command Chick. This game includes multiple game modes where players aid a strongman in dancing, jumping, or swimming, either by following action commands or button mashing. Kinji explains why they made Short Warp so odd. This game was made when I was almost on the edge. My mental status was getting very unbalanced, so 
so I wanted to balance myself back by creating a game like this. I was thinking, if I'm going to create a game like this, I should do something really crazy. Warp used the additional funds from Short Warp to finish their next interactive adventure. Enemy Zero is the follow-up to D, and while not a sequel, it is often considered the second entry in the unofficial D trilogy. This is almost entirely due to the fact that Enemy Zero is the second game to star Laura. Only this time, she is Laura Lewis, not Laura Harris. Kenji considered Laura and his other characters to be digital actors and actresses who would play multiple roles across different games. Enemy Zero is an alien-inspired science fiction horror game. On a spaceship heading back to Earth, Laura Lewis awakens from cryogenic sleep when the emergency systems activate. She contacts the ship's engineer, Parker, only to witness his evisceration at the hands of an unseen entity. Laura gathers her equipment and sets out onto the ship to figure out what's going on. Enemy Zero is similar to D in many ways. In explorable rooms, Laura is once again restricted to rails, moving around to specific points in the room looking for clues and items. When in hallways, however, the player is allowed to roam free. A short ways into the game, players are also equipped with a chargeable gun that allows them to kill the game's enemies. This is not like other space shooters, however. In Enemy Zero, the aliens are all invisible. The only way to sense where they are is to use the VPS, or Vex Positioning System, which uses a series of rising and falling tones to indicate how close an enemy is. The game spans across four discs, providing several hours of gameplay and story. The game's soundtrack was composed by Michael Nyman, known for composing such films as The Piano and Gattaca. Kenji was a fan of his work, and one day happened to catch wind that Nyman was in Japan donating pianos to schools in Kobe. Kenji invited him to meet in the hotel he was staying in, where they conversed for six hours before Kenji finally convinced him to score Enemy Zero. Nyman produced a 14-track soundtrack for the game that was later released on CD. Warp also released an extremely limited version of Enemy Zero, of which only 20 copies exist. Arriving in crates with the game's logo on it, multiple items came with a copy of the game, including a full Enemy Zero outfit as worn at Warp's Tokyo Game Show booth, a towel, a model of an enemy corpse, a bookmark, a flyer and ticket to a 1996 Enemy Zero art exhibit, a set of press releases, a VHS video of Enemy Zero music clips, a 3D lenticular sheet, a set of stickers, a t-shirt, a replica of the energy gun, design documents from the game's development, floppy disks, envelopes, and paper bags with the Warp logo, and a mysterious Sega Saturn stamp CDR all for the price of 200,000 yen. That may sound like a high price, but there's one more detail. Kenji personally hand-delivered each one himself. He took the company truck to all 20 buyers and spent about 30 minutes with each of them, talking and sharing interesting stories. Kenji said, I wanted to do that for a long time, so I was really happy to do it. It was around this time that Warp hired a young, inexperienced animator by the name of Fumito Ueda, a man who would later go on to direct the highly acclaimed games Ego, Shadow of the Colossus, and The Last Guardian. Kenji would say of him, At the beginning, he didn't pass the application process at Warp, but I still remember the work that he submitted. It was about a dog running in the rain. His ideas and his concepts really struck me, so even though he originally wasn't even on the hiring list, I handpicked him because I saw his potential. Fumito would only work on two games with Warp, handling a few cutscenes on the D Director's Cut and as one of the main animators for Enemy Zero. Fumito would later say of his time at Warp, I'm not at liberty to go into all the details, but it was an extremely fun company to work for. I was only there for a year and a half. Everyone was extremely dedicated though, and super capable. There was a saying you used to hear a lot then, don't sleep in your chair. When you're sleeping in your chair, no work can be done, but you also aren't getting a good rest either. So they'd tell us to lie down if we wanted to sleep. I think those were wise words. I've come to really understand their meaning now. Shortly after Enemy Zero's completion,
he would move to Sony to begin work on Eco. Around the time of Enemy Zero's completion, Kenji had an opportunity to visit a group of visually disabled people who revealed to him that they enjoy playing video games, including his own. Their dedication to the medium touched Kenji, and the cogs in his brain began to turn. He remembers. I thought that if you turn off the monitor, both of you are just hearing the game. So after you finish the game, you can have an equal conversation about it with a blind person. That's an inspiration behind this game. Real Sound Kaze no Regret was exactly that. The game features no visuals. Real Sound Kaze no Regret Pitch Black. Playing as a sound novel of sorts, players make choices based on sound cues. The game was never translated and remains a Japanese only release. The plot is about two elementary school students who fall in love and attempt to elope. When their plan fails, they are unable to see each other for several years, though fate brings them together again as college students. Despite the lack of video, Katsutoshi Eguchi reported that Kenji encouraged the actors to act out the scenes in the recording booth, including a kiss, for authenticity. Sega wanted exclusive rights to the game. Kenji agreed, but on one condition. They would donate 1,000 Sega Saturns to the blind, and he would throw in 1,000 copies of the game. Sega accepted the deal, and went through with the donations. Kenji included a pack of herb seeds in every case. He also included a manual printed in braille. He stated his purpose in an interview. The main reason for including seeds was that Real Sound is a love story, and it's a game that has a totally different concept from my former games, like horror games or the smaller titles so I wanted people to understand the atmosphere of the game. Another reason is that I felt like I wanted the users to grow and support the game. I was also thinking about releasing sequels, so I wanted the users to grow the game, grow the franchise. Though the planned sequels never got produced, the game was re-released on Sega Dreamcast two years later. This time, it includes photos of nature taken by Eno himself. This release also came with seeds and a braille manual. Speaking of the Sega Dreamcast, when it was under the code name Katana, Sega held a contest to name their new system. Out of 5,000 entries, one anonymous entry suggested Dreamcast, as well as the spiral logo and a startup sound. According to Katsutoshi Eguchi, this man was Kenji Ino. However, this has never been confirmed by Sega. Following the critical success of Real Sound, it was time to return to a game many years in the making. In 1995, Panasonic announced their next console, the successor to the 3DO, known as the Panasonic M2. According to one 3DO spokesperson, the M2 could generate 1 million polygons per second with the graphics features turned off, and 700,000 polygons per second with the features turned on. There were even plans to make the system with DVD playing capability. One of the launch titles was to be D2, the next major game from War. Teased in the original D's director's cut, as well as many issues of Live 3DO magazine, D2 was to be a direct sequel to D. At the 1997 Tokyo Game Show, the Warp Staff's booth was dedicated to the arrival of the Cherry Blossom season, with Kenji acting as Master of Ceremonies. On the third and final day, they revealed D2 to the public. Taking place around a year after the previous title, D2 would focus on a deal made between the Devil and Vlad the Impaler to bless Vlad with a son. The Devil grants his wish by traveling the future and stealing Laura's unborn son from her womb and presenting him to Vlad. Players would take the role of Laura's son in an effort to rise up and destroy the entities who destroyed his mother. It was to be a real-time 3D action game where characters fought with swords. Unfortunately, after many months of marketing and 50% of the game being completed, the Panasonic M2 was canned, and so was D2. Or so the world thought.
Years after its initial announcement, production, and cancellation, D2 found new life on the Sega Dreamcast. Only this was a very different D2 than the one Warp had previously teased. Instead of being a direct sequel to D, D2 was now its own story, much like Enemy Zero. Players would not be controlling Laura Harris or her son, but a new character, Laura Parton. A mysteriously silent woman whose life is tragically changed when terrorists hijack the plane she is riding. During the attack, however, the plane is struck by a meteorite and crashes in the middle of the snowy Canadian wilderness. Laura awakens her in a cabin, where another survivor named Kimberly has been watching over her. It has been ten days since the crash, yet she only found Laura two days prior, leading them both to wonder how Laura survived for so long. After a hellish creature bursts into the home and is killed by yet another survivor named Parker, the girls decide it's time to find a way out of the frigid Canadian wilderness, and the player takes control. With its fusion of genres including adventure, shooter, horror, FMV, and RPG, D2 is quite possibly Warp's most diverse game. For the first time in a Warp game, Laura is controlled from a third-person perspective in a fully fleshed out 3D environment. Players are tasked with exploring the environment to search for clues and other survivors. If the biting climate wasn't enough, the land is also played with horrific creatures that hide in the snow. When players encounter one, the game shifts to a first-person shooter. Instead of turning the camera in 360 degrees, players can press the X and B buttons to turn towards different enemies, where the gun can then be freely aimed. At the end of battles, players receive points that can lead to leveling up and an increase in health. Being a traditional survival horror game, health items are scarce, so if players intend to survive to the end, they must hunt their own food. D2 is incredibly ambitious both for its time and for Kenji himself, and covers a plethora of existential themes. It is a game that uses all of its assets as a medium to tell its story. A game that seeks to be not just an interactive adventure, but a piece of art to be pondered. How did Warp follow up D2? They didn't. Despite Kenji telling Famitsu that their next game would be an RPG that would sell 300,000 copies, and many meetings being held about the game's design, it never came to be. Kenji explains, I don't really want to talk about what happened that much, but it was kind of Sega's fault. It wasn't related to D2's sales or anything, but there was a time when Sega cut out all second parties for management reasons. So the very day I heard that, I called my friend Joichi Ito, and he just said, alright, why don't we work together now? And that was very rare timing for me because I had no contracts at the time, and that was the very day that Sega told me the news, so I just decided to do it. And I was feeling that I wanted to get away from games a little bit, because since I was 18, I'd been creating games full time, and I wanted to see what's out there in the world outside of the game industry, so I thought this was a good chance. That's why I stopped making games. Kenji would go on to describe D2 as having the same thick atmosphere that you can feel in a band's final album. Despite pulling away from the game industry in 1999, Warp did not disappear, but rather transformed into Super Warp. Super Warp was comprised of Kenji Ito, Katsutoshi Eguchi, and the rest of the current Warp staff. Their original intent was to create online games, according to a statement they made in April of 2000. However, by October of 2001, they made a decision to shift their business to web development. A month later, the game programming staff was regrettably let go, and new members joined. Three months prior, Super Warp had also changed its name once again. It became what it is known as today, from yellow to orange, or Phyto. Katsutoshi Eguchi had this to say about the new branding. Our feeling was the web was quite... Cold might not be the right word, but an unfeeling place. It was founded with a view to communication, and we felt we wanted to make it more human, more warm. So, from yellow to orange. Fido's original focus was on internet services, mobile phone applications, online music, and DVD products. Their first service, originally conceived by the Itochu Corporation, was C-Mode, a cellular service that would allow users to store their money in their phone to make paying for drinks easier. As the years went on, Kenji refused to do any interviews. Never interested in his own past, he fully invested himself in his present projects. From Yellow to Orange continued to find work and investors, and Kenji's history as a game designer drifted further and further into the past. That is, until the announcement of a new sensational product. We would like to play. When Kenji saw the Wii Remote for the first time, he began to conceptualize all kinds of uses for it. He became so excited that he made his own Wii Remote out of paper just to get a feel for it. He said, In the past, there were the addition of buttons, going from the Famicom to the Super Famicom, then the addition of the analog stick, but for me the greatest development was a Wii Remote, so that is what really attracted me to the Wii. Ideas began flooding in his head. 
One idea that came to mind was people struggling to balance on top of a giant cube. One thing led to another, and in September of 2009, You, Me, and the Cubes was born. Exclusive to the now defunct WiiWare, You, Me, and the Cubes is a physics-based action puzzler in which players attempt to keep a series of cosmic cubes in balance. To do so, players throw creatures, named Follows, that are stored in the Wii Remote onto said cubes. A quota of Follows must be reached, and there must be one on each cube before the time limit runs out. If the cubes remain balanced for at least three seconds, you win and move on to the next round. There are 72 levels total. 36 above levels, and, once the game is beaten, 36 below levels. When a row of levels is completed, players are treated to a psychedelic pattern of light, reminiscent of Eno's earlier works. With each level completed, another note is added to the menu song. There is also a two-player mode in which two players share the responsibility of flinging one follow each. At the end of the round, a ranking appears to tell you how compatible you are as partners. A very warp-like final touch. You, me, and the cubes mark the return of Kenji Ino, and through its aesthetic and sound design, it was clear he was fully invested. He said, There were a few times that I did try to come back to games. I even started making a game with a famous creator. There were several concepts like that in the past, but I always thought that I wanted to come back to games after getting everything else sorted out. For me, I'm almost 100% devoting my time to game creation. I'm remembering that it does take a big effort to create games. I'm feeling that again. I'm remembering that again. Good. Congratulations. Around this time, Kenji also began doing independent work on mobile games. He collaborated with notable game designer Kenichi Nishi of Chibi Robo fame on the Newtonica series of iPhone games. In Newtonica, players control a large, multicolored ball as red and blue cubes fall from above. Players must match the cubes to the correct color on the ball to increase the meter on the top of the screen and intensify the music. When the meter is full, one more cube allows players to score a point. The player is challenged to see how long they can keep this up. In Newtonica 2, the goal is to guide ducklings wearing space helmets through a series of mazes. By tapping various buttons dotted around the screen, the duckling is propelled in a straight line, bouncing off of other creatures and walls until it reaches the exit portal. In later levels, different, more complex mechanics are introduced. An add-on was released for Newtonica 2 called Newtonica 2 Resort. It simply contains more difficult levels. One more app, Newtonica Music Player, is an app that simply allows users to listen to the soundtrack from the first Newtonica by spinning the ball. Buttons on the bottom can be pressed for additional sounds. Another game, more famous in the West, is One Dot Enemies. In this game, enemies that are only a single pixel in size infest your phone screen, and you must squish as many as possible. Colored skulls arise as they are squashed, and certain combinations can lead to sound indications and color splashes. Once you have killed some One Dot Enemies, you can go to the results screen and flush them into the ether where the global total of enemies killed by all players is updated. You can also tap the sides of the screen to play piano notes. In 2009, Eno created a YouTube channel called Kenji EnoTube. Over the next three years, he uploaded 50 songs, some independent, some collaborations, and garnered 1,420 subscribers. Sometime in early 2019, the channel was deleted for unknown reasons. Beginning in October of 2002, Kenji became well known as a blogger on his website. His blogs garnered from 3,000 to 4,000 daily readers. Shortly after the 2011 earthquake and Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan, Ino began reflecting on life and the dangers of nuclear power. He became inspired to write a series of blog posts called Messages for My Children containing messages of peace and caution that he wished for his children to understand. After gaining much attention in Japan, interest was raised in publishing them. In May of 2011, they were compiled and published as a children's book titled Dear Son. Though written in Japanese, English translations mirror the text of each page. Illustrations by Miyawaki Kiyomi decorate the pages with peaceful scenes of nature. 
In January of 2013, Ino approached Katsutoshi Eguchi with a new project he had in mind. It was called ILCA, a school dedicated to innovation, learning, creativity, and arts. The school would produce workshops, media, symposiums, and classes centered around entertainment media such as games, manga, and anime. It opened in April of 2013 and still holds classes today. Though Kenji fully intended to serve as the dean of the school and teach classes personally, this would never come to be. Two months prior to the school's opening, on February 20th, 2013, Kenji Ino passed away of hypertensive heart failure at the age of 42. Whether it was his asthma, his work ethic, or the clove cigarettes he smoked that pushed him so hard is unknown. Katsutoshi Eguchi had this to say about Kenji's final days. He went to America about two days before he died, and as soon as he touched back down in Japan, he went to his office and went to work. He never rested. He didn't even go home on weekends. He just worked straight through. He had asthma from sometime when he was an adult. He developed it. He went to the hospital a couple of times for it, but the medicine, the treatment he was given, never took hold. So he always wrestled with asthma and poor respiration. Even on the day he died, he had an asthma attack, so he suffered from poor health. Regardless, the legacy Eno left behind far outshines the circumstances of his passing. In Japan, there is an event known as CEDEC, or CESA Developers Conference, in which games and game designers are appreciated. When he died, the public pushed to nominate Kenji for multiple awards, though CESA was hesitant due to their troubled history with Eno. One award, the Game Design Award, is voted for by attendees. Kenji was put up for this award and won it by a landslide. Against all odds, Kenji was also awarded the CEDEC Game Design Grand Prix, given to the best designer of the year, supposedly doubling second place in terms of votes. This shocked many, considering he had not released a major game since D2 13 years prior. The vengeful judges had no chance against the community's love and appreciation for Kenji and his work. Despite the finality of death, the legacy of Kenji lives on in the form of existing design documents entrusted to his friends and co-workers at Pyto. One project in particular still has the chance at seeing the light of day. Kake Zoon is best described to the words of the developers themselves, posted by Eurogamer in November of 2014. The world is controlled by a hyperdimensional conscience called Dimension N. This dimension was created from numbers, and is ruled by geometrical figures and polyhedrons. From here, the player faces hyperdimensional battles with creatures which have been sent in. The player must create this world, decipher numerical figures and numbers, and liberate the world from Dimension N, beyond time and space. The world of Kakezun is composed of story stages and action stages. In action sections, the player selects from a large quantity of numerals which spring forth at certain points from the air and ground of the game's world. Players will answer the challenges from the selected items in the game world. If the correct answer to a problem is chosen from the various selections, the world responds with a delighted melody, the terrain of the world changes, and the player may advance. If the player answers incorrectly, the world makes a dissonant sound and edges closer to collapsing. In October of 2013, former Warp members came together to form a new company called Warp 2 Incorporated mission of seeing Kenji Ino's vision live on in the video game industry. They're the ones heading the Kakezun project. An Indiegogo fundraiser for an alpha build raised 5,486,300 yen. Further news about Kakezun has been pretty quiet since 2014, but as of March 2019, no official statement or other implications have been made that the game is cancelled. All players can do now is wait and see what Warp 2 brings to the world. To find information on Kenji Ino, you have to dig a bit. Old magazines, Japanese interviews, archived websites in the Wayback Machine. There's no official memorial, no Hall of Fame entry, no post-mortem biography detailing his full life. As the history books of video games are written, Kenji has certainly earned injuries for his entire career and the way he directed his games, ran his company, communicated with his audience, and shook up the businesses he took part in. One can only imagine what he would be creating on current and future generation consoles had he lived the longer life he deserved. If we're lucky, his history will have influence on present and future game designers, musicians, and artists alike.
OK。ない。